We were studying uh, the book of Revelation last week in the churches, the, the seven churches of Asia. Let's go back to the book of Revelation. And uh, as I started to think it last week, I feel like I'm an auctioneer standing up here trying to just <laughs> give you all this information. Ken, this is the second time around and some of the others that are dropping in and out here. Where did we finish last week, Ken? I believe we, we are at the beginning of our... Thyatira? Thyatira, yeah. All right. So that's a 606 AD, but... 606 to 1517. Thyatira. You say second chapter of Revelation? Yeah, we're in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. You get to go back to that stuff of things. By the way, if you want any of these tapes that I've taught on the God's eternal purpose, church history, or Revelation, uh, if you want them, they're two dollars a piece. Or the whole volume, vinyl folder, was sixteen pages, thirty-five dollars. If you want them to say, if you want to borrow them to catch you up wherever you are, you may do that also. I'll let you borrow those tapes. I've done them uh, so you could study with them, and also they go out to different study groups all over the country, in the east and west coast, north and south. But uh, if you want any of those, they're available. I'll try to get them to you as, as cheap as I can. And if you can't afford them, I'll let you use them. So that's, that's cheap enough, isn't it? <laughs> All right. We studied uh, the, the, the church at Ephesus. All right, that's 2 and verse 1. Then uh, what does Ephesus mean? Relaxed. Relaxed. All right. And we find out that uh, the, in the early ages of the uh, of the, the churches of the Lord, some of the practices began to be relaxed, and we find that happened about 251 A.D. Some of the the practices of those churches began to be relaxed, and then the, we we studied the church at Smyrna, and remember that this teaches about the churches that were in those areas at those times, but prophetically he was also looking forward to what would happen during the church age. And how long is the church age, by the way? You scholars out here, how long is the church age? So again, how long is it? How long is it? When does it go from where it goes? Well, it goes from uh, uh, the, well, the preaching of John the Baptist, the Baptist. Well, from, all right, yeah, from Christ to the rapture. All right, to so the second coming all right. of the Lord. That's the church age. All right. That's <coughs> it. We're at the end here somewhere. I don't know where. Before the end. And this tells you here a little bit about the things that would happen during the church age with these churches and also what was happening in Asia Minor at that time. Pergamon. What does that Pergamon? Well, let's we'll go, go back to, to Sardis, Sardis, or Smyrna, that is. Smyrna. <coughs> what does Smyrna mean? Suffering and bitterness. And that church suffered greatly. And that was between 251 to 313 A.D. And those early churches then that suffered bitterly, didn't they? And you know, the Lord doesn't have anything bad to say about this church, does it? Because it was suffering. One thing about persecution, it refines the truth. Mm -hmm. When people are suffering terribly, the word of God, the truths of and God's people are refined. And then go down to uh, Pergamum. The angel of the church of Pergamum. What does Pergamum mean? Twice married. Twice married. <laughs> All right, twice married. And that's when the church was married to the state from 313 to 606 A.D. And we're going to go back. Now we're, we're jumping ahead through history and we're covering the whole church age, okay? As an oversight. Then we're going to come back and look at specific times in here, okay? Specific times. Pergamum means twice married. And then we go to Tyra Tyra. Verse 18. And I don't believe we read this. And to the angel. And who is that angel, by the way? Okay. That messenger. What? He's the pastor. Alright? To the pastors, to the teachers in these churches in this age. That's what he's talking about. To the pastor of the church in Thyatira, write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like polished brass, say this, 
I know your deeds and your love and faith and service. Brother, what's your name? Brian Mills. Sorry. Brian Mills. All right. <laughs> I'm going to down here. That is, there is no problem. You can come in as late as you want to and leave as early as you want to. Sorry, I work with you people, not against you. <laughs> Pull together. I know how obligations and things are. The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished brass. What what does this mean, eyes like a flame of fire? He can see everything. He sees and judges as he sees. His feet like brass. Brass in the Bible stands for what? Judgment. Judgment. All right. I know your deeds and your love and your faith and service the first appearance, and that your deeds of late are greater than the ones the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray, and so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Idols. And I gave her time to repent, but she didn't want to repent. As simple as that. Behold, I will cast her down upon a bed of sickness, a sick bed, terminally ill, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Now, he's talking about these sick churches during this time, the churches that had become married to the state. God's churches... In the back of this little book here, they were putting up with a lot of persecution down through the ages. All right? Here's your little chart in the back of the book. This, this red dotted line here stands for the blood of these people that were shed. And this up here is the hierarchy of the church of Rome. And then it's split here in the 900s. And the Eastern and Western Catholic Church split, and then all of Protestantism come out of those streams from there. Okay? And we see that, and there is a line of these true churches down through coexisting with them, but being persecuted by them. These churches here never shed one drop of their blood. All right? But these here did not understand what religious freedom was at all, nor would they tolerate it at all. We'll get into that a little bit more. We're going to study from that little book. Yeah, is, we're going. is this considered the Dark Ages, Jim? The Catholic Church started the Dark Ages. Catholicism started the Dark Ages, and, and we'll, as we go on, we'll study that. The Word of God was written originally, the New Testament was written in Koine Greek, which was the most common man's Greek. Everybody understood Greek from one end of the, the known world at that time to the other. Greek was the, that was a, the word Koine means common, common language. That's one everybody knew. They had their own dialects from the towns. If you go over to Europe today, and you go to different countries, they can speak about five languages. Most of them learn. Most of them. Most of them speak several languages. If you go back to Pennsylvania and back to the East Coast, you'll find out, even in Minnesota and different places back through there, you'll find out that those people are speaking two and three languages. All right? Because uh, they deal with each trace, they deal with each, these little people that came from Europe and settled those, in those areas, and they speak German, and they speak French and Italian and uh, Polish. Whatever in these languages, they, they learned these languages. Now, it was the same way in Europe at this time, all the way through the Middle East and Europe and Asia Minor. These people all spoke a common language, which was Greek. Okay? The New Testament was written in that language. It was given to us by 100 AD, or there, shortly thereafter, the Word of God was completed. The Catholic Church. And the age of purpose. Married to Satan and the church together. All right. Constantine Great and the church uh, became one. The Roman Empire. Before that, the churches were persecuted by the Roman Empire and by Judaism. Okay? Those two forces. 
But now, the true New Testament churches are persecuted by so-called Christendom also. And then they started having the councils, the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Trent. Uh, we'll cover some of those down through here and the different things that they were declaring. You can declare what you believe from the Word of God, and that's fine. But the church state now that began in 325 A.D., what it declared to be the truth, if you believe different than that, you were dead meat. As simple as that. There was no give me no leeway. And what they established, some of the things that they said were true. But remember, the state not only was the church, but it wielded the sword. You could chop your head off. And they said, we believe in this. If you believe differently from this, you've got problems. In 251 AD, there was a conflict in Rome between salvation and the churches he represented, and Cornelius and the churches he represented at that time. Novation says, we will not accept anybody back into our churches that have denied the faith without being openly baptized again. Again, this Anabaptist stuff. Okay? And then the church in Rome, and the, in other words, the people in power under Cornelius, they said, no, we're going to accept them back. And just let them come back. Well, Novation and his group would no longer receive and give letters to the other churches. And the other churches says that Novation and his group couldn't establish a pastor in any city where they had a church. Or they'd kill them. That's, I mean, that's how you deal with That's how the, there wasn't any leniency, no uh, religious freedom at all. And that's what we call, that's what the Lord said he hated, the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. That's people rulers, okay? People that get in and establish a state church and rule over people's lives. One of the two things that they did to completely control people's lives, number one, to be a citizen of the state, you had to be baptized at childbirth, at birth. Mm -hmm or shortly after you only have so many days to be baptized. The infant baptism, because that made you a citizen of the state. And if you did not baptize your child, you were an enemy of the state. It wasn't that you were undoctrinally unsound. That didn't really bother them a whole lot. But you were an enemy of the state now, and you were going to be killed. You would be killed. Number two, they demanded that all of the Christian people, the citizens of these states, have a marriage license when they got married. How far <laughs> have we gone? <laughs> really. And the, the early Baptist churches said no. Actually, until about 1700, they would not have a license to marry. That was a state church. You married, you, you started... Baptists have always stood for separation of church and state, far apart. You leave our spiritual life alone, and we won't bother your state business. We'll serve your wars. We'll do whatever else needs to be done, but leave our spiritual life alone. The Catholic Church says you have to get a, a certificate to be married, and the Baptists said no. Of course, they were known as as Donaldses, Paulicians. Uh, Waldenses, and we're going to study all those names and how they got them at that time. But they would not do that, and they said that they were heretics, and they were persecuted and killed because of that. How many of you ever been in these old Catholic churches up and down the, the coast? How, how many of you have ever seen all the tombs and the walls mm -hmm. and in the floors and out in the gardens? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to bring you in a couple of weeks a statement by John Lawrence von Mosheim. He was a Lutheran historian about the Paulicians, what they believed for 1,200 years prior to his writing, or more than that, about 1,500 years, which went all the way back to Christ. He said all the early Christians were Baptists in practice. And then he said that they did not believe in marriage. They did not believe in burying their dead in church cemeteries or churches. The Catholic Church... They said that the churches in the altars and the vaults and the walls and in the floor and out in their gardens 
when you were buried there, you were secured. You have to have a license to bury somebody in there, and you had to pay that stuff. Okay, and it had to be a certificate, and they couldn't make it to heaven unless you got your certificate. Unless you got the certificate, and you could bury it. They said we won't have anything to do with your marrying, and we won't have anything to do with your burying, with your burying because that was manipulation of the masses to control over the masses. Do you understand where all these things came from now? As you come down through, through history, and you'll find them lambasted down through history for practicing these things. And we'll go back and study those some of those doctrines as we go back through history. Well, those three areas, citizen of the state, baptism, and marrying, or marrying, and then burying. Those things control the masses. If you could control that part of a person's life, you had him under control. Okay? And those state churches, that's what they wanted. Now, as you come down through history and you come into the Protestant Reformation, we have Protestants coming out of the Catholic Church practicing a warmed over Catholicism. All right? Basically, it was every one of them established a state church somewhere and practiced literally no freedom of religion, only except for them. All right? We're not going to go into that deeply here, but this, we're overviewing history right now. Okay? Thyra, Tyra, continual sacrifice, that's what Thyra, Tyra means. Okay? And I know that you hold uh, the, the doctrines of the uh, of uh, Jezebel. What did Jezebel do, by the way? What did this rascal do? She was a real pretty lady, wasn't she? You know, pretty is as pretty does. <laughs> this lady was a beautiful lady, and uh, she ruled her husband. Remember who he was? Old Ahab. In the Old Testament, Jezebel and Ahab. And she had a man commit perjury and lied about a man named Nabal about his vineyard. Old Ahab wanted that vineyard. And he, he went and, talk, and talked to uh, Ahab, talked to Nabal and said, I'd like to buy your vineyard. He said, I can't sell the vineyard. The law of God says that I can't sell my property. It has to stay in my family. So old uh, Ahab went home and said, ooh, 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 ooh. I want that vineyard because it's so cute. And I can't get it to his wife, Jezebel, and she says, what, how did you try to do this? He says, well, I asked him, I wanted to buy it. He says, you know, I'm going to cost you a dime, I'll get that thing. Oh, boy, just sit back. Just watch me get that thing for nothing. She goes out, and the Bible says, by two or three witnesses let everything be established. So she hired some guys to say that Naboth blasphemed God and the king and had him stoned to death, and his property was confiscated by the king. Sweetie pie, here's your vineyard. You no longer have any name on problem. And then she took God's people and she says, You can go on and worship your home, all right, but come over here and worship my God, too. Just, just uh, be a little liberal. Just come over here and, 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 uh, and fellowship with us, too. Just mark this, take those lines of demarcation away. We can word, we can we can worship God together. You go worship Job in your home, but let's go out here and, and uh, fornicate together. That's what exactly what her religion was. It was a, a religion of fornicate, open fornication in public. And they offered I offered these feasts and sacrifices to idols. And pretty soon, once there was no separation of truth and error. Then it all became error, and then these people were led astray from God, and God was angry with them. Same thing happened with Balaam, too. Remember? Well, God hates that type of thing. And he says, uh, I gave her time to repent, but she wouldn't repent. And then God says some very strong things here. He said, I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am the one who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you who read, the rest of you, the ones remaining in Tyre, who do not hold to this teaching. See, he's talking about the true New Testament churches now. Those who are holding on to the truth during this ridiculous era of compromise. Compromise. 
Okay? I say to you, who do not hold to these teachings, who have not known the secrets of Satan, the deep secrets of Satan, as they call them, I place no word of burden upon you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold on fast till I come. And he who comes, he, and he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him will I give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father, and I will give to him the morning star. And he who has let him hear, hear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then he comes down to the third chapter, and to the church, or the angel of the church in Sardis write. You remember what Sir, Sardis meant? Sardis. That thing is coming out. And this age of Sardis, this age of coming out, this was when the reformers left the Catholic Church. Left out. But they never had any more authority than the Catholic Church had. And the Baptist told him back, 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 back at that time. Luther left the Catholic Church. John Calvin left the Catholic Church. And they came out. Calvin never tolerated Baptists at all, period. He would say, children. Luther worked with them some. Okay? Now, Calvin was a, a legalist, an absolute legalist. He wrote some of the most profound writings in the Institutes of Calvin and everything. In the early part of his life, he was more strict than he was in the later part of his life. His writings, even, he wasn't even a five-point Calvinist in the end of his life. About a four-pointer then. Okay, <laughs> three and a half, four-pointer. But in the early part, he was real strict. And as he went on and as he learned and things, and he saw some of the things that he had done, especially the persecution, his students wrote an apology to the public on the grave of one of the people that he, con that he condemned and, and he ordered to be killed. And I'll bring you that thing too later on. But all of these people, down through these ages, that God's churches, by these several names, were trying to coexist with them. And sometimes they were giving up the truth and joining with them. So they would be persecuted. Simple as that. Luther asked the the Anabaptist, at one time, he says, come and join us, but just throw away your rebaptizing business. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, under no circumstances. And then he came back to them again to represent his little down. He said, well, just support me a little bit. Because we're having a real hard time out here, and persecution is heavy on us. And they said, well, sure, we know what that is. We've been facing that forever. You know, We'll support you that you have a right to believe what you believe. And we'll stand behind you, and we'll vote in the areas where we are, and so on and so forth. Well, as soon as he got in power, then guess what he did? He wanted freedom for him mm -hmm. and his Lutheran church. Okay, and this is these are Bible historical facts. You can go back and look them up in history. And this book right here is one of the greatest books. He puts out so many of those little facts in here. And if you want to look up in the back of the book. And those of you that want one of these, if you want to look up Calvin and Luther and everything and all the different things that they did during the time, just look up their names. I will go back and tell you. It'll index it right back. One of those going to be in. All, what? One of those going to be in. I want to know how many wants. <laughs> Raise your hands because I want to only order how many you want. No, we I'll order them and then you can pay for them. How many wants? Okay. Uh, they're about $15. I don't know for sure, but around $15. You can get one a piece or, or one in your family or whatever, two in your family, whatever you want. There's one, two, three. All right. You got one of these. Don't you? You've got one. It's, that's the most, that is the most sound book for. I'll get about six of them. Yeah. Uh, you recommend the second volume? We're not even going to cover that. If you want that second volume, I'll order it for you. That tells you the history of the, the late history of these churches as they came to America mm -hmm. and the history of all the, the Great Awakening and all that. Like you, is that a sound historical? This is a sound book. This man does not lie to you. You can go back and trace his references. So many who historians are not honest historians. <coughs> Luther, I mean, that the Lutheran John Lawrence von Mosheim was pretty good. He didn't always say and talk about Anabaptists as wonderful people, but he did have enough unction to tell the truth about it. 
And he wasn't for me. He was a Lutheran historian, but he did tell the facts. And, and, there, and it's, but that's about six volumes, I think. And the one that I have, the, 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 the set of books that I have by the Moshe was printed in 1798. So it's, it's over 200 years old. And uh, in bad shape, <laughs> I'll bring in, I'll, I'll make some copies out of it. We're going to study the, the doctrines of the Paulicians as we look at them. Okay? And I know that some of these things may be astoundingly different than what you've ever been taught or what you've studied about history in your life. But this is a conglomeration. I, I took history about at least four times from four different teachers, church history, and uh, or four, maybe six different teachers. And I still have a lot of the tapes. Brother Kim listened one of the tapes with me as we were working. I listened to him at work. And a great, a great teacher by the name of I. K. Cross. He was one of my teachers. I took geography and history, and, and I went to a, on a geological and archaeological tour to Israel and all over in that area with him. He was just a tour guide over there, an archaeological tour with him. He was a great man. He's still alive. One of my older teachers is still kicking. <laughs> that's, that's what you get for getting old. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> we go in here to Sardis. Sardis means coming out. Now we uh, come to the age of compromise. The next one's even worse. Okay. And to the angel of the church in Sardis right? He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds and that you have a name, that you are alive and you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. Remember, there was a lot of compromise at this age. This was in the 14 and the 1500s. Okay? And this covers from 1517 to 1638. All right? Strengthen the things that you have, and uh, and you are about to die, and I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my my God. Remember, therefore, that you have what you have received and heard, and keep it, and repent. If therefore you will not wait up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know of what hour I come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk me in white, for they are worthy. All right? We're going to talk about these churches. Now to the he or come shall be clothed in white garments, and I will erase, will not erase his name from the book of life, and actually the book of deeds of life. That's what it's talking about there. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has, him, has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So we talk about Sardis. Now Philadelphia. How many have heard of the city of Philadelphia? What is the city? What does that name mean? Brotherly love. Brotherly love. It comes from two Greek words. Philo and Adelphos. Simple. Comes right into English from Greek. I love my brothers. This is the age of the Great Awakening. George Whitfield and uh, Clark, Clark, well, Clark, well, Clark, John Clark, he was the one who founded the First Baptist Church in America. John Clark, and then Roger Williams, <coughs> but uh, Whitfield. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a great awakening in America, but also that's when things started. Everybody just loved everybody. Yeah, Whitfield just came in. Whitfield came in preaching in all the churches, mm -hmm. so no matter. Well, where he was, was from. And remember, I told you that what? Well, question concerning the Sardis. It's from 1518 to, to what? 1517 to 1638. All right. And then this Philadelphia now is 1638 to 1812. To so the angel of church in brotherly love, right? He who is holy, he who is true. Now, he's making a contrast between God and them. He who is holy, he who is separate. The word holy means separation. It means not of earth. That's what it literally means. And he who is true. Were these churches that had compromised true to God? What were the basic things that God taught Israel as they went, would go into the promised land? Be separate. Be separate. 
hold to what I told you. Do not compromise. Be separate. Don't do it. Okay? Who is holy and true and has the key of David? Who opens and no one will shut? Who shuts and no one will open? Says this. I have the real authority. I am the one that gave authority to my churches. I don't care who stands up and says I have authority who kills who. I am the last word. That's what the Lord is saying. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, but who, which no one can shut because you have a, a little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will call those of the synagogue of Satan, the gathering places of Satan. The gathering places of Satan. You know, the Lord founded his churches. Satan founded thousands. We live in a world of isms today. And every flavor and color of the truth out there that you can think of. From ab just absolute lies and the imagination of man's minds <laughs> to almost truth. Every flavor of it that you can see. The synagogue of Satan who say there are Jews that are not but lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down at your feet to know that I have loved you. You're bowing down to the feet of these kings and rulers and are chopping their heads off in different parts of the world down through the ages. And you, when, it, when you had to die, when you had to die for your faith, you died. But now we have come to the age of compromise. They don't have to die. They could join Luther or some of the other reformers if they just lay down some of their practices and just compromise some. You understand what it's talking about here in history? They just compromise some. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. I come quickly, hold fast to what you have in order that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will give him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it any longer. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, and my new name. He who has him here, let him hear what the Spirit says in his churches. And to the messenger, the pastor of the church of Laodicea, and that's the age of which we live. Now this is coming home. He doesn't have much good to say about us. <laughs> At all. We're here. Down in the end of this age. Laodicea. What does that mean? Laodicea. Any of you remember? It comes from Laos. The Greek word. And decayo. People judgment. Everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. I'll make my own decision. I'll do it my way. All right. That's what he, that's what that term Laodicea means. Laodicea, people judgment, doing what is right in their own eyes, making their own judgment. You know, the Word of God was written down very definitely in the most perfect language in the world, so it could not be misinterpreted. Peter says it is of no man's private interpretation. It is so perfect. You just want to look at it. And let it, in, in, let it interpret itself. Let God speak. Don't put your ideas in it, but let Him speak His word to you. It's perfect. It'll straighten out a lot of doctrines. It'll straighten out a lot of doctrines and a lot of theology of people. The angel of the church of Laodicea <coughs> writes, the Amen. The Amen is a particle of affirmation in Greek. Here it's used as a pronoun describing the faithful one, the Amen. A long time ago, the word Amen came from the Persian language. That was the first historical use we have of it. It's Persian, Persian word. It came from Persian into Hebrew. It never changed. He was still Amen. Then he came into, from Hebrew, into Greek. And it wasn't translated. It was just transliterated. All right? Then he came into English. All 
all right? Give you a little short, short illustration of this. Brother Hubbard pastored a church back in the hills one time, my, my Greek and Hebrew teacher. And there was a man there by the name of Mr. Torn, Tornstall. C.B. Tornstall was his name. And he was a farmer. And he had a great big wife and he was a little big man. And uh, she kind of ruled the roost, but he wouldn't go to church with her. And finally one day she got the rolling pin out and she said, Mr. Cornworth, stop, you're going to go to church with me today. I don't have time. She said, you're going to do it. Are you going to meet the circumstances here? There's going to be <laughs> some results. So you stay at home today. So he went to church with his wife. And she marched him down and set him on the front row. And the first thing the preacher did was to call on him to pray. And he started praying. And he prayed for everybody in the church. He prayed for the for all the deacons. And he prayed for his wife and his kids. And he prayed for the preacher and his wife and his kids and everybody. And went on for about a half an hour. He just kept on praying. Finally, one of the, in the back of the church, one of the deacons said, Amen! You know, like this. And he turned around and he said, Thank you, brother. I've been trying to think of that word for the last 15 minutes. And he said, Amen! <laughs> Well, that word means, <laughs> I'll stand behind it. It means that you'll prop it up. Literally, it was a prop. Like that camera back there is propped up on that tripod. That's a prop. That's an amen. That's a prop right here. That's holding that up. And Israel stood down at the bottom of the mountain when Moses went up there. When God sent Moses down, he read the law to them. And every time that he would read one law, Israel would say, Amen. We will stand behind it. We will keep it. But they never did. They never kept the law of God. And when Jesus came to them, many times you'll find in the New Testament, in the original language, sometimes they'll say, truly, truly. Ever see that in there? Or all men, all men. That's all the word all men in the New Testament. Jesus, before he ever spoke a, an indictment or a, a truth, he would say, all men, all men, I absolutely mean, and I'll stand behind every word that I say. Israel said it at last. He said it began in the beginning. And that's why he was doing. He was contrasting the word of God against their weak speech, their lies, their unfaithfulness. He says, send the all men, the faithful one, the true witness. See the contrast? The contrast that he has here, the beginning, that actually it says the head of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds and you are neither, neither cold nor hot, and I would that you were either cold or hot, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you up. You make me sick at my son. That's what he said, you make me sick. This is what the Lord says to us today. You make me sick. You don't have any principles to that. God's people ought to contrast drastically with the world. And today, it's hard to tell who a Christian is and who the world is. Mm -hmm. They dress alike, they act alike, they talk alike. They work alike. Because you say that I am rich, and I have become wealthy. Now also, Laodicea was one of the richest areas and one of the wealthiest areas back at this period of time. Because I have become wealthy, we live in America today and our med medium standard of living is so much higher than anything that was ever known in history. We have a car driving it by the house. We have food to eat every day, most of the time. These, these are luxuries in all reality to a lot of people in the world. He said, yeah, I don't have any need of anything. You do not know that I, that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You know, when God, what was the problem at the Tower of Babylon? <laughs> Remember when God judged mankind in the Tower of Babel? What was the problem? What, what had they done wrong? 
They had gathered in one place. They had gathered in one place. What, what was the commandment of God? Go out in the world, spread yourself out. Go out there and don't build cities. Go out and spread and and just depend upon me every day for what you need and I'll give it to you. They didn't want to do that. They did the opposite. They built a great monument, a great city, and a great religion. And they built that tower. By the way, that tower was finished. In the Hebrew, it's finished. It was completed. They had built a tower so tall that everybody could see it. And it was a tower serving the, 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 their imaginations of the gods of heaven. They studied and worshipped the signs of the Zodiac and so forth. And this tower had all of those signs on it. They found parts of it. They had finished it. And God judged it. He confused the languages. And he divided the earth from man. That's what he did. And man went wandering all over the earth again. Different places. Now just look at America today and the rest of the world. When we, he confounded the languages so they couldn't communicate with each other. So they couldn't make terrible plans. And destroy one another. All right. Where are we in history now? We communicate all over the world. The world may as well not be divided by continents. If you talk to Europe, Asia, anything instantly. Communication all over the world, and you fly across the ocean in hours. Judgment time. Can't. <laughs> you are rich, but you're poor, naked, and blind. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourself. In this area they have some of the best whitening. The white their clothes, their clothes, they have some of the best garments. Beautiful white, beautiful garments. He said they aren't good enough. You the, and, the, and this is one of the richest banking areas in the old they had lots of gold there. But what God said to them, your gold is no good. You need my pure gold, stamped by the God of heaven. All right? And uh, what garments that you may clothe yourself that the shame of your nakedness may not, may not be revealed. And I slab to anoint your eyes that you may see. Some of the greatest uh, eye doctors in the ancient world were here at Laodicea. And they had eye salve there that was supposed to cure and help blindness and any kind of eye sickness. And the Lord says, all of your doctors and all of your schools and your education and your riches and your wealth are nothing. Don't depend on what you have in the world, but what I have, the truth. Those whom I love, I reprove and I discipline. But be zealous, therefore, and repent. I stand at the door and knock. Now we see this many times that God, and, and they use this in, in, in Revelation 3.20, he's standing at the door of a heart, a lost person is knocking. What he's trying to do here is get in the churches, true churches. You block me out. I'm trying to get back in. I want a fellowship with you. You know, the Lord said to his disciples, his little church when he left, when they take the Lord's Supper, what are they doing? They're fellowshipping with him with him. And you do this and remember to me until I come back again. And then in my kingdom I'll, and I'll dine with you. You know, eating is something that everybody likes. It? Eating and fellowshipping. The early church gatherings were many times at dinner time. They would eat and they would preach the word of God and, and eat and preach and eat and preach. Sound like a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they did. <laughs> I stand at the door knock. I want in. I want back in my place. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. And I, as also I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He was an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. And then in verse chapter 4 it says, Men talk after the after the church age, something happens in the rest of the world. All right? That's what happens there. We, we're studying that, aren't we, on, on Wednesday night? Mm -hmm. All right. Go to the, uh, the little handout I gave you here on this King James thing. Let's look at it. This, 
Now, King James Version of the Bible was translated for the Church of England by the Church of England by about 50 uh, of their scholars. And one of the commandments that King James gave them before they even started translation, he said, do not translate anything contrary to what the doctrines of our church teach us. We're going to have a meeting every time you come upon a place like this, and we're going to figure out what we're going to do when we come to something we can translate. And that's why we have such many misconceptions and many isms out in the world. The, the, the idea of this... Uh, baptismal regeneration thing. They believed in baptismal regeneration, didn't they? That's when you're, you're, you're baptized for the remission of sins, like Acts 2.38. Let's go read that thing from King James. Somebody. Anybody got King James around here? Hold on. All right. Hardly any translation of the different Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Uh, that's good enough. And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. What does that say? You're baptized for the remission of sins. It says that very plainly, doesn't it? What it says in the original language, let each, allow each, each one of you allow yourself to be immersed because of the remission of sins in the name of the Lord, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What was the gift of the Holy Spirit? What was the administration of the Holy Spirit? Of the Holy Spirit? Pentecost. Well, it came upon, the administration came upon the church on the day of Pentecost. And we had a Paulus in the New, in the New Testament that didn't know what the gift of the Holy Spirit was, that discerned the administration of the Holy Spirit in the Lord's churches. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit that it's talking about right here. The administration. We, as Baptists, have always taught that a person must be born again. And then you're baptized because you have been born again. And then you're fellowshiped in the, into the New Testament church. That's the order. Salvation, baptism, church membership. And that's exactly what it's talking about here. But they didn't believe that, did they? All right? They didn't believe it. And they did not immerse for baptism, did they? They had a problem with that word. King James says, you, you translate that word immerse, I'll kill you. <laughs> as simple as that. Don't do it. And they said, well, what are we going to do? And he said, well, just don't translate it. Let's just put down baptize. That'll, that'll cloud it up enough. They won't know what it means. And the reason why they didn't do that, remember, King James had two problems in England at the time. Who started the Church of England, by the way? We're going to get to that pretty soon. But who started the Church of England? King James. What? King James I. No. Huh? Henry VIII. Yeah. You know why he started? Why did Henry and the Eighth chart the Church of England? It had something to do with his wives. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was, he, he, he was a defender of the Catholic faith at one time. Mm -hmm. But King James wanted to get rid of the wife. He had a bunch of them. He got rid of a bunch of them. You mean Henry VIII? Uh, Henry VIII, I mean. Thank you. <laughs> Henry VIII. <coughs> anyway, he was married to Catherine of Aragon and he wanted to marry Anne Boulder at that time. So he, he had petitioned the Pope for a period. The Catholic Church had control of the whole known world at that time. Okay? If you were a king, you couldn't even get married who you wanted to marry. You had to get permission from the Pope, especially if you're a king. Because he was going to look at that country and he was going to figure out who the best wife for you would be for him to keep control of that country. So he had to okay any marriages. Now the Pope would not allow him to marry Anne Boleyn. Henry VIII had married his, his, his brother's wife. His brother died and when he was 12 years old, he was engaged to Catherine Maragall, which she was from Spain. And she was a strong Catholic. And that was what the Pope wanted. He wanted him to marry her because that would ensure a strong leadership of the Catholic Church in that country. 
Well, in the meanwhile, Henry VIII, he fell in love with Anne Bowen. And he had, well, he had courted a lot of women, but Anne Bowen was the one he wanted to marry. And he wanted to marry her and, and bring forth a firstborn son. He wanted a firstborn son from a woman. Well, the Pope would not hear it. So finally he said, okay, forget you, Pope. Get out of my country. Stay out of my country. Don't come back. And from this point on, every church that's in this country that was a Catholic church is no longer a Catholic church. It is now an Anglican church, a Church of England church. All the priests and everything are going to answer to me. And I'm going to put one arch archbishop under me, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and that's my religion. Get out, stay out. And the first thing he did was, I now can get married. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Now that's why the Church of England was started. All of the Catholic Church's property in England was confiscated. And you had war after war after war with the Catholic Church trying to get control back in that country. And we're still having problems over there today because of that same, very same thing. Okay? Well, in King James' time, which was a different period of time now, they still had the Catholic problem, but they also had a Baptist problem. They burned so many Baptists in England that they about ran out of fire and would burn them. They just would not quit popping up. The truth does something to people. It really changes their lives. And here we have the Church of England, we have the Catholic Church still trying to get a foothold there, and we have the Baptists, or the Anabaptists. They were first known as Baptists in England, by the way. They dropped the word Anna. The Anna means re -baptized. So King James said, well, we got these Baptists out here preaching the Word of God from the original languages, all up and down the country, saying that, that this, this is what they believe. The Catholics basically didn't allow their people to have any Bible. It happened for hundreds of years. And they only believed the rules and the dogmas of the Catholic Church. That was simply what they believed. The, the dogmas, the rulings by the Pope. And the Pope was the revelator. Okay? Well, King James had these people translate his Bible so that his people, his church, would have a Bible. So they could counteract the Baptists mainly and keep their people from becoming Catholics. He wanted a Bible that taught what he believed in his church. And when it was finished, the Baptist right away said, this is a perversion of the Word of God. And they burned them. <laughs> they burned them over and over in different places. And this is the dedication letter to the king, King James. All right, let's read it real quick. Great and manifold with the blessings, most dread sovereign, which Almighty God, the Father of all mercy, has bestowed upon us, the people of England, when first he sent your majesty royal person to rule over and reign over us. For whereas it was the expectation of many who wished not well unto the Zion, he's talking about the Catholics and the Baptists, all right? That upon the setting of that bright Occidental star, Queen Elizabeth, of most happy memory, some thick and palpable clouds of darkness would so have overshadowed this land that men should have been in doubt which way they were to walk. Do you know what this is? This is propaganda. This is a sales pitch <laughs> to the people. And that it should be hardly be known who was to direct the unsettled state, the appearance of your majesty as a son in his strength, instantly dispelled those supposed and surmised mists, gave unto all that were well affected, exceeding cause and comfort, especially when we beheld the government established in your highness and your hopeful seat, by an undoubted title that this also accompanied with peace and tranquility at home and abroad. But among all our joys there was no one that more filled our hearts than the blessed confidence of the preaching of God's sacred word among us, which is, is this inestimable treasure, which excelleth all the riches of the earth, because the fruit thereof exceeds itself, not only to the time spent in this transitory world, but directeth and disposeth men unto that eternal happiness which is above in heaven. Them not to, them not to suffer 
this to the fall to the ground, but rather to take it up again to continue it in the state wherein the famous predecessor of your highness did leave it. He's talking about Henry VIII and the establishment of the Church of England and the continuation of the Church of England. Okay? Of all its religious opposition during this time. No, and to go forth with the confidence of the resolution of a man in maintaining the truth of Christ and propagating it far and near is that which has so abound and firmly knit the hearts of all your majesty's loyal and religious people unto you. Now the head of the Church of England is who? Mm -hmm. The king. <coughs> all right. And that your very name is precious among them their eye does behold you in comfort and they bless you in their hearts. And every time there's a personal pronoun here, it's all capitalized like it should be in deity. <clears throat> Alright? Pay attention to that. Every personal pronoun and reference to the king is capitalized as if he was deity. And as to, and, and the Pope in Rome is indomitable, isn't he? He's a representative of Jesus Christ on the earth. Did it change much? From Catholicism to this, <clears throat> sanctified person who under God is the immediate author of their true happiness. Boy. And this, their contentment, doth not diminish or decay, but every day increases and takes strength, that when they observe that the zeal of your majesty toward the house of God doth not slack or go backward, but is more and more kindled, manifesting itself abroad into the farthest parts of Christendom. By writing in defense of the truth. Now they were going out after this period of time, you know, we'd already, the Spanish Armada had bit the dust. Okay? And, now, and the Spain ruled the world for Catholicism. Now England is becoming the mistress of the sea, and she's going out conquering and conquering in the name of her country. All the Catholic churches up and down the coast here and on the east, east and west coast are all Catholic. All the ancient missions and everything were established by Spain. You know how they got there? In the name of Spain and the church. All right? We see this all established. Now England's going to go out and repeat what Spain did which has given such a blow unto that man of sin. He's talking about the Pope now. The man of sin. <laughs> As will not be healed. And every day at home by religious and learned discourse by frequenting the house of God, by hearing the word preached by cherished teachers thereof, by caring for the church as a most tender and loving nursing father. Talking about the king. There are infinite arguments that this right Christian and religious affection in your majesty by none is more forcible to declare it to others than the vehement and perpetuated desire of accomplishing and publishing this work, which now with all humility we present to your majesty. For when your highness had once out of deep judgment <clears throat> apprehended how convenient it was that out of the original sacred tongues together with comparing of the labors of both in our own and other foreign languages of many worthy men who went out before us, there should be one more exact translation of the Holy Scriptures into the English tongue. Your Majesty did never desist to urge and to excite those to whom it was commended. He, he kept on urging them and prodding them along that the work might be hastened and that the business might be expedi expedited, expedited in so decent a, a matter as a matter of such importance might justly require. And now, at last, by the mercy of God and the continuance of our labors, it being brought into such a conclusion as that we have great hopes <coughs> that the Church of who? England. The Church of England shall reap good fruit thereby. We hold it our duty to offer it to your majesty, not only as the king and sovereign, but as the principal mover and author of the work, humbly craving your most sacred majesty that since things of this quality have ever been subject to the censorship of ill-meaning and disconsented persons, that's Baptist that he's talking about. 
It may receive approbation patronage from so learned and judicious prince as your highness is, whose allowance and acceptance of our labor shall more honor and encourage us than all the culminations and hard interpretations of other men. Well, again, he's talking about Baptists. Of other men shall dismay us. So that if on the one side we shall be produced by popish persons, <laughs> Who do you think he's talking about? The Catholics. At home, or abroad, and who therefore will malign us because of our poor instruments to make God's holy truth to yet be more and more known unto the people. The only way you can keep a, bat or a Catholic from continuing to be a Catholic is showing the Bible. And the Bible leads him away from that. I mean, it does. Catholicism and the Bible don't agree to the young lady. You came out of that. Yet it was a problem for them. Whom they desire shall to keep in the ignorance and darkness. They don't want for people to study the Bible. Okay, let's say uh, Catholics. Or if on the other side we shall be a maligned by self-conceited brethren. <laughs> That's Baptist. <laughs> who run their own way and give liking unto nothing. <laughs> but what is framed by themselves and hammered out on their own anvil, we may rest secure and supported within by the truth and the innocency of a good conscience, having walked the ways of simplicity and integrity as before the Lord, and sustained without by the powerful protection of your majesty's grace and favor, which will ever give confidence to honest and Christian endeavor.